Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Garrett Strakoff, and today we will, we will be covering chemical reactions and chemical rates, reaction rates. Our objectives are to talk about chemical equations, stoichiometry, Le Chatelier's principle, equilibrium constant, reaction rate, the reaction rate order, and then some practice problems for you to work on your own. On the right hand side here, you can see a reaction of methane uh, burning to form CO2. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a burning, it actually can be in cellular tissues, tissues too via an enzymatic reaction, but methane in this case combines with two oxygen molecules to form CO2 plus two water molecules. And that's something we can we can look at it visually. You can see the, the images with the little red and gray and white balls, but you can also see that it can be written out in an equation too. CH4 plus two O2 yields CO2 plus two H2O. So when we talk about chemical equations, as you, this, the letters and numbers written on the bottom equivalent to the little atoms and balls that you can see above. So chemical re equation is a symbolic way for chemists to visualize what is occurring during chemical reactions. Reactants on the left, products on the right, just like this. So we have here, we have sucrose, C12, H22O11 plus oxygen yields water plus CO2. And this is what happens in your body when you eat sugar. So sucrose on the left combines with the oxygen that you breathe. That's why you have to breathe to make water and CO2 that you then breathe out, expel. But I have a question for you. Did anyone notice that there's something wrong with this above equation? Did anyone notice that there's something not quite right about this equation? It's not balanced. So if you look at the number of carbons on the left and the number of carbons on the right, they're not the same. See, there's 12 carbons on the left, only one carbon on the right. Same problem with hydrogens, just 22 hydrogens on the left, two hydrogens on the right. And so this is not a good chemical equation. It doesn't tell us, it tells us what's happening. It tells us what the molecules are that are combining together to form other molecules, but it does not tell us what the ratios are. So it doesn't count, it doesn't satisfy the conservation of mass, which is a pretty important law. Stoichiometry is a fancy word for a simple observation, the concentration of mass. Sorry, conservation of mass, which is that things have molar ratios in which they molar ratios in which they react. So stoichiometry, this word, by the way, stoic, stoichio, just means element. I, I, I never, actually never knew that until I was preparing, preparing these slides, but I Googled it and it said stoich, stoichiometry comes from the word, that's uh, a Greek word that means element, and metry is just a Greek word that means me measurements. So stoichiometry is a fancy word that just means a way of measuring elements. So if, if concentration of mass is true, and you can think about this on your own if you want, but if you have a certain number of carbons and a certain number of hydrogens and a certain number of oxygens combining together to form other ones, then if this if the number of each individual atom was different on, on each side of the equation, if there are many, many times when that wouldn't satisfy the, the conservation of mass, which is a, a law. And in science, when we talk about laws, those are, those, those are the things that have been proven so many times that we generally say they, they have to be true. There's a lot of things that are theories, but the law of conservation of mass is true. It has to be true because there's been so many observations that hold it to be true. And lucky for us, chemicals tend to react with each other in simple integer ratios, meaning just one to one, two to one, three to one, three to two, that sort of thing. Yeah, like we talked about earlier, methane plus two oxygen plus goes to one CO2 plus two H2O. And you can look at it, you can see, oh, there's one carbon on each side. There are four oxygens on each side. There are four hydrogens on each side. So it's a balanced equation. The number of atoms of each element are the same on either side of that arrow in the middle. So let's go ahead and figure out what that would be. We're not gonna go too into the weeds with chemical equilibrium in this class. It can, it can become very complicated. Sorry, sorry, when I say class, I mean in this mini lecture, it can become very complicated, but we'll do a simple example. So sucrose combining with oxygen could be a combustion reaction, could be an enzymatic reaction, but it forms some water and some CO2. And we're gonna talk about what, what that ratio is. So on the left side of the equation, we have 12 carbons. On the right side, we currently have one. And so we can try it, try it out. What if we put 12 CO2s instead? Now we have 12 carbons on each side. On the left side of the equation, we have one, sorry, not one, 22 hydrogens. On the right side, we currently have two hydrogens. So let's try putting 11 
water. So now we have, we've balanced our carbon, we've balanced our hydrogen. The only thing left is to balance our oxygen. So on the right-hand side of the equation for oxygen, we have 11 in the water, we have 12, 24 in the CO2, 11 plus 24 gives us that we have 35 oxygens on this side. On the left side, 35 oxygens. On the left side, we currently have 11 in our sucrose. Sucrose is still just, just a one-to-one -one ratio. So sucrose has 11 oxygens, which means we need 11 oxygens, which means we need 24 more. And so we bring in 24 here. And this is 12O2 because we it's O2. There's two, two oxygens in there. So we can just double check. 12 carbons on the left, 12 carbons on the right, 22 hydrogens on the left, 22 hydrogens on the right, and 11 plus 24, 35 oxygens on the left, 35 oxygens on the right. So this is now a balanced equation. We now know that for every, oh, in, in, in terms of stoichiometry, the biggest reason we use stoichiometry is because of the ratios. So we now know that we need 12 moles of oxygen for every mole of sucrose that we want to burn. And when we burn a mole of sucrose, we'll get, we will get 12 moles of carbon dioxide and 11 moles of H2O, because a mole is, is directly proportional to the number of atoms in the reactions. Stoichiometry is very important to engineers, particularly when you think about mechanical engineering and, and internal combustion engines. In an internal combustion engine, you put in a certain amount of fuel, you need to put in a certain amount of air usually. And if you do that, to the right ratio, you get certain conditions in the in the in the system in the combustion chamber. So it's pretty important that you know exactly how much air you have going into your into your the cylinder or into your engine. It's also important to know how much fuel is going into the engine. This works both for jet engines and internal combustion engines. So a stoichiometric amount of air is exactly the amount of air that you need to burn the fuel that you have and have complete combustion all the way to CO two. Less than stoich stoichiometric is lean. Lean sounds good because it means you use less fuel, but it leads to higher temperatures, it can cause engine damage because of the like, high temperatures on the, on the sharp points inside the engine. And then carbon monoxide forms too, because you're not going all the way, your, your, CO, your fuel is not burning all the way to CO2. It has not enough oxygen, so it burns to carbon monoxide instead. So you need to uh, run somewhat richer. Rich is good. The problem with, with, with being too rich, being more than stoichiometric fuel ratio, is that it leads to a lot of unburned fuel being exhausted. And unburned fuel is actually one of the main sources of smog, the kind of smog that we used to have in California really, really badly 40 years ago. Civil engineers are also concerned, concerned about stoichiometry, but we, we describe it differently. So a, a mechanical engineer really does say that they need the stoich, they want to know the stoichiometric ratio of fuel to air for their, their engine. In civil engineering, we talk more about the amount of water and we measure the amount of water in concrete. For example, so concrete is a reaction between cement and water to form calcium hydroxide crystals. If you have too little water, then you don't get a full mix. It doesn't convert all the way from calcium oxide into calcium hydroxide. And so you, the thing that I was thinking about is it's kind of like imagine a building that's being held together with very expensive dust. It'll just fall apart. Too much water, and then you get a problem where the cement particles are too far apart, and they don't efficiently coalesce into uh, the calcium hydroxide crystals. So when we when we make concrete as civil engineers, it needs to be the perfect amount of water. Too little water it will not be strong enough. Too much water it will not be strong enough. Reactions can go both ways. So a ATP is the energy currency of eukaryotic cells. It's also the energy currency of a lot of prokaryotic cells too, so bacteria. Energy comes from the dephosphorylation of ATP to ADP. And I should probably tell you, is that ATP is adenosine triphosphate, ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So phosphate is this molecule right here. It comes off of ATP to form ADP. And as it does so, that energy that's being released is used by the cell to make all kinds of other things. So all the, a lot of the enzymes in your body are, are powered by ATP being broken down into ADP plus phosphate. So when you blink, when you swing a bat, when you have a heartbeat, when you read that word, all, we've read these words, all those things are powered by ADP, ATP being converted to ADP in your body. So why do we not have a lot of excess phosphate in our bodies? And why do we, why do we not worry about like having phosphate too much, you know, excretion in, in various ways that we excrete you know, chemicals? 
The reason why is it's actually reversible. So I've been talking about taking sucrose, combining it with oxygen to burn off into CO2. That releases energy, and our body's able to take that energy and actually go the other way. So when we take food into our bodies and combine it with oxygen, our bodies have enzymes that are able to take the ADP plus phosphate and turn it back into ATP. And so you can see, in one case, I've got the arrow pointing to the right. In the other case, the arrow is pointing to the left. And so we're actually reversing the reaction by changing. And I don't want to talk too much about like Gibbs free energy and and like thermodynamics of chemical reactions in this class. That's that's for a future class or for a future uh, discussion. But you might need to just think about it in terms of the fact that reactions go both ways and they are often in balance. Now the Schottler's principle, and this gets back to this why we just talked about reversible reactions. Because chemical reactions are reversible, they can go one way or the other. So the reaction above us actually is fairly one directional. So burning sucrose into oxygen, you don't generally see CO2 then somehow combining back with water and turning back into sucrose. It's a one way street in this particular example, but let's not worry about that right now. <laughs> uh, so what Le Chatelier's principle says is that if you increase the concentration of one or more of the constituents, you expect to see the equation go in the other direction. It changes the equilibrium of the equation. So if you increase the concentration of the reactants, the ones on the left, you expect to see more products being made. Same thing, if you increase the concentration of the products, you expect to see more reactants being made. And so, like I said, for the, for the combustion of sugar into CO2, you need enzymes to make that CO, to make that, that back into sugar. But for a lot of things, like acids actually in water, right, is a good example. An acid in water is actually in equilibrium between the protonated and non-protonated form. So you have some, even if you add hydrochloric acid to water, there's some chloride floating around and there's some HCl floating around in that water. And so the unprotonated form, meaning hydrogen being the proton in this case, we think about hydrochloric acid goes to a proton plus a chloride, and that's a reversible reaction. Now, it's not very reversible. This is actually another example that above pH negative two, which is very, really, 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 really acidic, generally it's completely gone this way. So it's called a strong acid because it mostly deprotonates into chloride and protons. But other other examples like formic acid, they do actually form a lot of so formic acid is a better example of something that's in, in equilibrium. And depending upon the pH, you'll have one, more of one versus more of the other. And the reason why is pH is directly related to the amount of number of protons. And so if you have a higher number of protons, Le Chatelier's principle says you should have more of the protonated form. So, so yeah, so acids are a good example of engineering that we use to keep pH of a system constant. Okay, so what happens in this case, if we, if this is a reversible reaction, which I'm showing it as being by having the left and right arrow there, what happens if we double the oxygen concentration in this case? Would you expect, expect to see more products or more reactants? More would it shift to the left or to the right? And the answer is it would shift to the right. If you're adding oxygen in this case is a reactant. And so you would see more production of water and CO2 if you had more oxygen. What happens if we have some kind of way of scrubbing the CO2 out of the system? So we take the CO2 and we essentially remove it from the system. Well, in that case, what happens is because you have decreased a product, you again see huge shift towards the right. So because you've decreased one of the products, you see more uh, conversion of the reactants into products to kind of to try to fill that void, to try to, if the CO2 has been taken out of the system, when I say scrub, I mean, we use some kind of a chemical that absorbs the CO2. So we, we take the CO2 out of the system and then we see further burning of, of sucrose. What about if we double the CO2 concentration? So now you have more product, and you see that your equilibrium shifts to the left. Equilibrium shifts left because you have more CO2, more product there. So you would see less production of, of water actually and, and and less overall production of CO2. More of the oxygen and the sucrose would remain in the solution. 
So interestingly, because things, you know, because of the Le Chatelier's principle, we know that if we add more of one thing, we, we shift the equilibrium. But it turns out that there's something called the equilibrium constant. And so the equilibrium constant for a given temperature is constant. It, it's, it's always the same for, for a given reaction. So for the reaction A of A plus B of B goes to C of C plus D of D, D, you know, this being the stoichiometric number, the lowercase d, and then d being the constant, the, the chemical. We have to make sure we do use molar concentrations. I underlined it here, but molar concentrations, if we have products over reactants, we have C raised to the C power times D raised to the D power divided by A to the A divided by B to the B, we get a constant. And it's temperature dependent. So if you, if you increase the temperature or decrease the temperature, you'll see a different constant. But as long as you keep the temperature, whatever it reads on a book table that you can, you can look up tables of different uh, reactions, it'll tell you what the KEQ is. The equilibrium constant is KEQ. And you can think about Le Chatelier's principle again. If you have more of D, if this, is, if this is constant, if KEQ is a constant, if you increase the level of D, then you have to also decrease the, the level of A or B or both in order to keep that constant. If you decrease the level of D, and you expect to see A or B also decrease in order to keep KEQ constant. So it's really cool how you can, can connect all this together. You have Le Chatelier's principle is actually almost visually portrayed by the equilibrium constant. Now remember, products over reactants. This is one of the few things that I remembered from when I was an undergraduate student to 12 years later when I when I became a professor. So it's uh, it's. Product over, or products over reactants is something you want to drill into your head. And I think the reason why it's important to remember it is because it's easy to get it wrong because we always write, when we're writing equations, we always write reactants first because reactants go to products. And so we want to do reactants over products in our, in our chemical in our equilibrium constant, but it's not true. Okay. So what is the equilibrium constant of sucrose combining with oxygen to form water plus CO2? I'm glad you asked. So we draw our little line, again, products over reactants. So it's going to be the molar concentration of water. It has to be molar, by the way. Molar describes the activity of the, of the solution. Raised to the 11th power times the molar concentration of CO2. CO2 raised to the 12th power divided by the molar concentration of sucrose. Raised to no power because it's one, or I guess you could say raised to the first power, and then divided by oxygen, the molar concentration of oxygen raised to the 12th power. And just full disclosure, in water, the activity of water is zero, so this goes, it's basically one, so this goes to one. You remove that from the equation. And you're left with the activity of CO2 raised to the 12th divided by the activity of sucrose raised to the first divided by the activity of oxygen raised to the 12th. And that equals some value. Now, it turns out, like, like I said, because this, this is actually a combustion reaction and you see full conversion of, of sucrose into CO2, it turns out this is like pretty close to infinity is the answer. It's, it's a super high value, but it still means that there's some balance going on there. So the products are extremely favored because it's very high. The, 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 you expect to see a lot of the product. You expect to see a lot of, of CO2 being made. And because, let me backtrack. We know the KEQ was really, really high. And if it's really high, that means we expect to see a lot of products and a very small amount of reactants reaction in the, in the equilibrium. Shifting gears slightly, we talked a little bit about the chemical equi equilibrium, and I want to make sure you understand those are this is not re related to that. So chemical equilibrium is one thing; how quickly it comes to equilibrium is another another topic. And so that's what the reaction rate is. So we know that it comes that it has some kind of equilibrium. And the reaction rate is how quickly it comes to that equilibrium or how quickly it reacts. Now, the reaction rate can be symbolized as equal to some constant K times the molar concentration of A, the reactant times the molar concentration of B. So it's just the reactants in this case. And it varies with temperature. So with higher temperature, you expect to see faster rates. Usually about 10 degrees increase, 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature will double the, the rate, the, the reaction rate. And you've seen that with lots of things in your life. If you try to cook noodles by leaving them, at, actually, I don't know the answer to this, but I think I think you could cook pasta if you put spaghetti in water that was, let's say, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. It might eventually cook, but it would take something like four times longer 
And if you put it in at uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit at, at boiling. Unlike the equilibrium constant, you cannot really derive the rates from the chemical equation. So equilibrium constant is just, like I said, it's C raised to the C power times D raised to the D power divided by A raised to the A, B raised to the B. The reaction rate is not the same. That's, what the, that's where this comes in. So you have to determine it experimentally. And when you're doing an experimentation, when you're doing an experiment to find the reaction rate, what you're really trying to find is the K value, whatever that constant is. And just to let you know, we get that from the, the slope of, our, of a plot. Now, reaction rate order is important too. If you look at the reaction rate uh, equation that I have there, it's K times A to the N times B to the M. And N plus M adds up to the reaction order. So these things, N plus M, do not come from the, from the chemical equation. It's not part of the chemical equation. It's something that you find by doing the experiment. And when you do an experiment, you, you collect concentration versus time for a for a reaction, and you plot them in different ways. So a first order, it means that one of the, if you have N and M both, then one's going to be zero and the other is going to be one. For a second order reaction, it has uh, either one and one or two and zero uh, for the N and M. And for a zero order reaction, you have N and M are both zero. So what that means, by the way, if you think about a zero order reaction, if, if N and M are both, are both zero, you know, A raised to the zero is one, B raised to the zero is one, and so it's a constant rate. A zero order reaction just means that if you increase the concentration of reactants, it does not increase how quickly they are reacted or how quickly they turn into product. Same thing is true with first order. With a first order reaction, if you think about it, a first order reaction, the rate is equal to some constant times the concentration of one of the reactants, which means that if you double the concentration of the reactant, you double the rate. Because the, con the constant, of course, is constant. And the second order, this could be raised to the, like, it could be A squared. And so that means, and this, this does happen, where if you have a, if you double the concentration, you actually expect to see that the reaction proceeds uh, four times as fast. For what we do in biochemical reactions, so for environmental engineering in particular, most everything is first order. So it's always, if you double the, the concentration, you expect to see a doubling of the reaction rate. One other thing to mention too is if you are doing an experiment to determine the reaction rate constant, you need to keep your product concentrations low because you get that Le Chatelier's principle problem where you're converting your reaction, your, your reactants into a product, but if too much of the product is there, then the reactants don't actually react. And so you need to figure out a way to scrub the product from the system. So the way that we determine a, and I'm going to, I have an example problem, an example of this on the next slide. The way that we determine the reaction rate is by plotting it. And the way we plot it is three different ways. If you think it's a first order, a first order reaction, and usually they are, so that's what you start with, you plot natural log of concentration versus time. And if it forms a straight line, then you know you have a first order reaction with a slope of negative K. If that does not form a straight line, the next thing you do is plot just regular concentration versus time. For a zero order reaction, we don't see a change in rate with change in concentration. And so sure enough, if the data form a straight line, concentration versus time, just regular concentration, that's considered a zero order reaction and the slope is negative K again. And last but not least, if you think it might be a second order reaction, you plot one over concentration. So natural log concentration first, then concentration versus time, then one over concentra concentration versus time. If that forms a straight line, then it's second order and the slope is K. Okay, so here are some data that I put together. This is uh, fake data uh, that I made for the purposes of this presentation. And you can see we have time, probably in seconds. I didn't put a unit, but it doesn't matter. So we have time, we have concentration, we have natural log of concentration, and we have one over concentration all in our column here, or in our, our table, I mean. So is it a zero order? reaction. We're going to be plot just concentration versus time, and we do not get a straight line. You know, a straight line would look something like this. It doesn't look like that, so it must not be a zero order reaction. Is it a second order reaction? So we plot one over concentration, one over molar, with time, again, not a straight line, therefore not a second order reaction either. It, I mean, it could be, well, it could be two things. It could be that you have 
like a first order reaction. It could be that you have really bad data too. So it's possible to have bad data that nothing lines up. But in this case, since I've made the data myself, we can plot first order, we can plot natural log of concentration versus time. And sure enough, we get a nice straight line. And we know that our K value now is 0 0.56. 0 because it's negative, the slope is negative K. So K is 0 0.56 positive. And in this case, the y-intercept doesn't matter. It doesn't tell us anything. I have some practice problems for you. I want you guys to do the same thing that we just went through on the previous slide. Take this data, figure out what the reaction order is, the rate order, and uh, do that by, cut, cut, by plotting concentration versus time, natural log of concentration versus time, and one over concentration, uh, seeing which one gives you a straight line. And like I said, it is fake. This is fake data too, so it, it will give you a nice straight line. You'll be able to tell right away. And don't forget to also include the constant, the rate constant, K. And then the last question is, what is the equilibrium constant expression? So what is the KEQ for the combination of calcium and phosphate to form calcium phosphate? All right, I hope that was useful for you. I know that you'll be using stuff, you know, information like this in your future classes, and I wish you the best.